Welcome, 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 everyone. How are you? Chilly, a little bit, right? <laughs> welcome to the 2024 15th Great Lakes Bay Regional Martin Luther King Celebration. Are we excited tonight? Let's give a round of applause. We are excited for all these young people that are here. I'm Colette Boyd. You already know that because you watch me at noon and four every day, correct? On WNEM TV 5. I am so happy to serve as your mistress of ceremonies for this very special occasion. Our theme this year is working together and sharing the dream. This annual Dr. King holiday affords us all an opportunity to really reflect on the past while seeking hope, determination, and an opportunity to really act upon the promise of the future. This evening, the committee has planned a very, very, very special program in honor of Dr. King's birthday. We know that you will truly enjoy the talents and commitment of our community, our students, and our speaker, who I'm so excited, big fan of hers, Dr. Melissa Harris Perry, who will make the celebration truly one to remember. Let's just give her a welcome round of applause as she sits here. At this time, I would like to introduce Saginaw Valley State University fifth President Dr. George Grant, we enthusiastically welcomed Dr. Grant to the community one year ago. Can you believe it's been a year? And we are so delighted that he's here joining us again this evening. Let's give him a round of applause and welcome him to the stage. Good evening. Good evening. It's exciting to see you here today. Welcome to Saginaw Valley State University. You're part of the group of people from the community that have come together to put this event on. And it's great to see all of you out here. I, when I think about Dr. King, and we all know him and know something about him, but I've always felt that he represented something bigger, with what, which is the people who came before him, the people who are here now, and the people that will be coming. And so when we celebrate him, we're not just celebrating him, we're celebrating the people who helped make him, who helped motivated him. We're celebrating the people that we don't know their names. We don't know the sacrifices that they made because that happened a long time ago. But their sacrifices helped produce us, helped produce him, helped produce the next generation. And so today, this evening, as we come together, we come together to celebrate all of you for the sacrifices, for the commitment, for everything that you've done to make this community, to make this state, to make this world a better place. So on behalf of the university, on behalf of all of the people who've worked to put this together, I want to welcome you this evening and have a great time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grant. Let's give him another round of applause because he is doing an outstanding job for the community and the university. We appreciate all of you being here this evening. At this time, I'd like to introduce the leaders of the three community foundations in our Great Lakes Bay region. The first person is a superstar herself. She has been on my show twice this week, which I love her, Sharon Mortensen, President and CEO of the Midland Area Community Foundation, who will present the 2023 MLK Scholarship recipients. Diane Mahoney, CEO of the Bay Area Community Foundation, who will present the 2023 MLK Scholarship recipients. And Renee Johnston, President and CEO of the Saginaw Community Foundation. Please give them a warm welcome to the stage. Well, good evening. My name is Sharon Mortensen. I'm here tonight representing Midland Area Community Foundation. And as Colette mentioned, joining me are my colleagues Diane Mahoney from the Bay Area Community Foundation and Renee Johnston from Saginaw Community Foundation. The Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Regional Scholarship was created in 2005. It was a collaboration of the local chapters of the NAACP and the three community foundations. And, our, and then in, 19, or I'm, I'm sorry, in 2010, we elevated this into a broader regional um, context working with Saginaw Valley State University and Delta College. We're grateful to Dow as well as our three community foundations for providing scholarships for our students tonight. Dr. King stated the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of convenience and comfort, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. 
He spoke of courage, perseverance, unity, and sacrifice. These are values Dr. King espoused in pursuit of democracy for all. Values that remain critically important in today's world and values that our scholarship recipients have demonstrated. I believe Dr. King is looking down in delight and with a sense of humble pride, or maybe a better word would be gratitude, for what these young men and women have done and will continue to do throughout their lives. These students represent courageous voices that have spoken up and out for democracy and equity. Their actions have demonstrated their belief in our common humanity as well as compassion, love, and service to others. It go goes beyond lip service with these students as each has taken concrete steps to make our world, our community, our region a better place for all. Here are a few examples of their actions, starting a black student un union or alliance at their high school, leading a conference for youth engagement and philanthropy, chairing a Juneteenth event, organizing food drives to help the hungry in our community, tutoring students, and much more. To the mothers and fathers, those who have been by their side since day one, and to those who have stepped in along the way, the grandmas and grandpas, brothers and sisters, mentors, confidants, and teachers who have helped develop these caring, conscientious students, thank you. You're doing a great job, and indeed, the future is bright. We ask you hold your applause until we recognize all of our 2024 scholarship recipients. All right, let's begin with Ms. Emma Bacchus Kanushka from Saginaw Arts and Sciences Academy, who plans to study communications and is undecided as to where she will attend college. Next, we have Madeline Cha from H.H. H. Dow High School, who plans to major in business administration and is undecided where she wants to attend college. Next, we have Kristen Kappas from Bay City Western High School, who plans to attend Central Michigan University to study teaching English language arts. Next, we have Kelsey Corian from Bay City Central High School, who plans to attend Western Michigan University and major in vocal performance. And then we have Rebecca Emmons from Garber High School, who plans to attend Delta College to study nursing. And then next, we have Brandon Hoffmeister from Garber High School, who plans to attend the University of Michigan and study business administration. Clarice Hunt from St. Charles Community High School, who plans to attend Central Michigan University to study social work. And then Paloma Jolly from Midland High School, who plans to study biomedical engineering and is undecided as to where she will attend college. And we have Clara Kerr from Bully Creek High School, who plans to study engineering at Delta College. Isabella LaCourse from Bay City Western High School who plans to study business administration at Delta College. We have Zachary Lamont from Valley Lutheran High School who plans to study wildlife biology at Lake Superior State University. We have Temi Ocean from H.H. Dow High School who plans to study biomedical engineering and is undecided as to where she will attend college. Kelsey Schultz from Carleton High School who plans to study mechanical engineering at Grand Valley State University. Jacob Stoneback from Pinconning High School who plans to study computer science at Saginaw Valley State University. And Ashaya Washington from Saginaw High School, who plans to study biochemistry at Michigan State University. These are our 2024 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. scholarship recipients. <laughs> and next, Dr. Eric Gardner from SVSU will be out to introduce tonight's video presentation featuring our scholarship recipients. Good evening. Good evening. With our partners at Delta College and the Midland, Saginaw, and Bay Community Foundations, we're proud to share this year's scholarship winners reciting, I Have a Dream. Like SVSU, Martin Luther King Jr.'s best known speech, 
turned 60 in 2023. Uh, and a note about that, speaking six decades ago, Dr. King used the now outmoded term Negro. We've kept his language in the spirit of historical accuracy, but we also recognize that his broader sentiments remain timeless, and we celebrate the fact that our scholarship recipients are still keeping his dream alive. Let's watch, 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 watch. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But a hundred years later, the Negro is still not free. One hundred years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. And so we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring the sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We have also come to his hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. Those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But there's something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold, which leads us into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new militancy, which has engulfed the Negro community, must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. And they have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating, for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. 
No, no, we are not satisfied, and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friend, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right down in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every alley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so, let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, we will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, Free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last.
them a round of applause because these are our future leaders. Let's let them know we support them, we love them, appreciate them. Good work, job well done. Great job, guys. We will thank the students, ladies who introduced them, and Dr. Gardner. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Michael Gavin, President of Delta College, Dr. Reva Curry, Vice President of Instruction Learning Services at Delta College. They will present the Martin Luther King Jr. Drum Major Awards. Give them a round of applause as they exit the stage. Good evening. So it's refreshing to hear that speech with fuller context and understand that it's not just about a vision for the future, but also confronting the reality that promises made by America have not been yet delivered, and that the notion of true freedom and equality required systemic oppression to be dismantled by people who are often moder what he would call the white moderates who controlled power, but often didn't move. The three winners of the Drum Major Award tonight do the kind of work that Dr. King is aspiring for, and they do work in what I would like to call a way that is uh, formed in rigorous love. Often the work they do is not necessarily the sort that uh, is celebrated, though tonight I'll read their backgrounds and you'll see that their everyday work should be celebrated. The first awardee is Moira Brannigan who has served as the executive director at the YWCA Great Lakes Bay region since August 2019. Prior to her current role, she worked at the Great Lakes Bay Regional Alliance as the director of in internal operations and program director for the Institute for Leaders. Moira has specialized in program development and management, nonprofit operations and outreach in the for-profit and nonprofit sectors. In 2020, she began the Interact Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Program to fulfill the YWCA's mission to eliminate racism and to empower women. Inspired by similar programs at other YWCAs throughout the country, the initiative uses intercultural development inventory as the tool to drive these conversations in general. The inventory also provides a tool for further learning so participants can increase their intercultural experience and knowledge. Moira became an IDI qualified administrator, created the curriculum, and now she has, pre has presented the Interact to approximately 400 individual participants. She has a certificate in diversity, equity, and inclusion from Cornell University. She uses her work at the YWCA to address the barriers Dr. King acknowledged in his 1962 speech, where he said, people fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they have not communicated with each other, and they have not communicated with each other because they are separated from each other. Congratulations, Mark. <laughs> Our next awardee is Anita Jenkins, and Linda Holloman will be accepting the award for her. Anita Jenkins has spent 47 years in the Midland community as a dedicated community volunteer, activist, and a faithful philanthropist. After two years as a social caseworker in the Detroit area, she enrolled in the University of Michigan Law School looking for another way to help people. Anita served as an assistant attorney general for the state of Michigan before joining the Dow Chemical Company's legal department. She served on numerous boards, and she and her husband have given generously to help others in the community and the region. A quote she often shares, and I actually have personally heard her say this, to whom much is given, much is expected. Anita exemplifies this in her actions by supporting those agencies in the community that serve local needs, providing scholarships, and giving through her foundation. Anita is one of the founders of the local chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and was instrumental in helping to establish the Chapters Endowed Scholarship for the Midland Area Community Foundation. She generously shares her wealth of information of financial literacy by recommending books and encouraging others not only to be financially solvent but also financially support the local needs of others. Congratulations. <laughs> Our 
And in a bittersweet moment, I wanted to tell you that Joyce Seals is the winner of tonight's uh, drum major award, which is the sweet part. <laughs> Because of a death in, a, in her family, she could not make it tonight. And Eugene Seals Jr., who, is who works for the Saginaw Chamber of Commerce, will be accepting uh, in her stead. Um, a note of just person, uh, Joyce is one of the people that first welcomed me to this area, and I'm forever grateful for that reason to her. Joyce Seals attended SVSU for one year and then completed her BA in education from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. She started her career at the state of Michigan with the Department of Labor, working as an unemployment clerk, lead worker, and finally employment specialist. In 1990, the Michigan Department of Education hired Joyce as an education analyst, where she supervised the King Chavez Parks College program, a program created by Michigan legislature to increase the number of academically or economically disadvantaged citizens who have the opportunity to complete college and experience career success. In addition to holding a variety of occupations geared towards improving the lives of citizens of Michigan and Saginaw in particular, Joyce has devoted considerable time and energy to community activities. She served on the Saginaw City Council for 12 years, including a term as mayor, and she currently serves on the Saginaw Board of Education. She is co-pastor of the New Christ Community Church and a member of the Ezekiel, of the Ezekiel Project. Her community service has been honored by many organizations, including the YWCA, the NAACP, and the Bridge Center for Racial Harmony. Congratulations, Joyce. Dr. Gavin, and congratulations to our three Martin Luther King Jr. Drum Major Award recipients for your hard work, dedicated service to our community. We love you. We appreciate you. Another round of applause, please. So please join me now in welcoming Dr. Jesse Donahue, professor from the SVSU political science faculty, who will introduce us to my hero. I love her. She's wonderful. I miss her. I didn't miss NBC. Dr. Harris Perry. Dr. Jesse Donahue. Good evening. I'm, I'm very proud to be here and delighted to introduce these two speakers. And you have to bear with me because they're so accomplished, it's going to take me a while to get through reading everything about them. So I'm going to start with the moderator, Mrs. Kermit Anderson Diggs. Kermit Anderson Diggs is a former educator with the Saginaw Public Schools for 37 years. Presently, Mrs. Diggs uses her time and talents enhancing others' knowledge about the rich cultural history of African Americans. She's the chair of the Morally Enrichment Center, Inc., M-E-C-I, a nonprofit whose primary focus is securing the former Morley School grounds and park area as an urban outdoor education site that provides culturally diverse activities through the arts, sciences, sports, health and wellness, and environmental studies. The initiatives of MECI are Young Explorers, STEM, STEAM, and STREAM, and the historical significance of celebrating Juneteenth. Additionally, Mrs. Diggs is a member of the African Cultural Festival Committee, holds a life membership in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and is a 50-year member of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority, Inc. Kermit Diggs has been the recipient of many certificates, awards, and commendations because of her willingness to plan, organize, and volunteer in many different activities and projects in the Great Lakes Bay Area. Kermit holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Southern University Agricultural and Mechanical College, as well as a Master's degree from Central Michigan University. She spent several months attending post-baccalaureate classes in the teaching of reading, Teaching students, especially boys, to read was of, was of great importance to her. She's working together, sharing the dream. Kermit Diggs is a wife of Sydney, mother of Skip and Seth, mother-in-law of Monifa, and grand mayor to Jim, Jeremy and Tristan. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Dr. Melissa Harris-Perry. Um, she's professor, 
Professor Harris Perry is the Maya Angelou Presidential Chair of the Department of Politics and International Affairs, the Department of Women and Gender Studies, the African American Studies Program, and the Program in Environment and Sustainability at Wake Forest University. There she conducts research and teaches courses in American politics at the intersections of gender, race, and place. Melissa served as a final host and managing editor of The Takeaway, a daily national public radio program and podcast, which aired on over 300 public radio stations across the country. And along with Dorian Warren, Harris Perry is co-creator and co-host of The Takeaway special project Deep Dives with MHP and Dorian and the podcast System Check. Professor Harris Perry is founder and president of the Anna Julia Cooper Center, whose mission is to advance justice through intersectional scholarship and action. She's the author of award-winning Barbershops, Bibles, and BET, Everyday Talk and Black Political Thought, and Sister Citizen, Shame, Stereotypes, and Black Women in America. From 2012 to 2016, she hosted the television show Melissa Harris Perry on weekend mornings on MSNBC and was awarded the Hillman Prize for Broadcast Journalism. She served as editor at large for L.com and for Zora. She continues to serve as a contributing editor for The Nation. Professor Harris Perry is an award winning author and sought after public speaker, lecturing widely throughout the United States and abroad. Harris Perry received her BA degree in English from Wake Forest University and her PhD degree in political science from Duke University. She studied theology at Union Theological Seminary in New York. Harris Perry has previously served on the faculty of the University of Chicago, Princeton University, and Tulane University. Professor Harris Perry has been awarded honorary degrees from many universities, including Meadville Lombard Theological School, Winston-Salem State University, Eckerd College, New York University, and Ithaca College. Melissa serves on many governing boards and committees. She is a trustee of the Century Foundation, the Next 100, and the Makeup, Markup, excuse me. She and her family live in North Carolina. Please join me in welcoming them. Well, now, we've heard all of those things. <laughs> I have been referred to as a Melissa Harris Perry groupie. OK, I'll take it. Because I rarely missed any of your telecast, OK? Mm. Now, we have heard all of these things. We've heard that read. But tonight, we would like to know, who is Melissa Perry in her own words? Hmm. Who is Melissa P Harris Perry? Who is that? Oh, uh, first of all, thank you. Thank, thank you for the lovely introduction. Thank you for being here and being in this role. Thank you to all of the students um, for coming out to hear someone speak who I just have no doubt you have no clue who I am and that's really fine and lovely because I should have to earn your interest and earn your trust um, and earn your sense that, that I have something to say with you. Um, and, and really just thank you to, I know that, you know, an event like this takes a lot of work and planning and effort. And so thank you to everyone um, who was part of that work and planning and effort. So let me just begin with a few notes of gratitude. Um, hmm. um, I, I'm not sure that I was even prepared to answer that. I thought we were going to talk about who's Dr. King. So let's see. Who's Melissa Harris Perry? At the moment, um, I am very excited to discover that I am cold. <laughs> Um, and so I think um, there are many folks in the audience um, who will appreciate this. Um, I made it to level five, i.e. Uh, turned 50 in October. And I can tell you that I uh, haven't really been cold for about six months. Um, and wasn't, <laughs> wasn't really sure I was ever gonna be able to be cold again. So I'm really, I'm grateful to the state of Michigan for demonstrating that in fact at negative 15 degrees, even someone in my particular stage of life can, in fact, be cold. <laughs> um, so I'm, uh, you know, at my core, I think of myself, the students are all like, what? Um, <laughs> the, only, the only people laughing are, right, those of us at, at level five, six, and seven. Um, 
Uh, I'm a college professor, but I, um, as, as my job, that's what, you know, that's what pays the bills and um, provides the health insurance, but I think of myself as a teacher. Okay. Um, and so when we were talking earlier at dinner and you were telling me that uh, you spent decades as, a, uh, as an educator, you know, if I, could, if I could be one thing, I'd like to think of myself as like the Miss Frizzle of, of political science. Like I really am at my very happiest on a school bus with 25 uh, young people, whether they're kindergartners or college students, um, kind of engaging the American project, right? Doing hands-on learning. Um, I, I typically would not be in Michigan on a week like this. I would be either in Iowa or in New Hampshire, yeah. having dragged students to one of those two places yeah. to kind of participate in the American project. Um, I grew up in Virginia. Uh, I am the daughter of um, an African American man who grew up in the Jim Crow South and went to segregated public schools. Um, and my mother is a white woman who is the fourth of five children in a Latter-day Saints family, was raised in Spokane, Washington. Mm -hmm. At the time that my dad was a college student at Howard University, um, not only a historically black college or university, but one that Howard grads tend to think of as the historically Howard, black yeah. college, the, <laughs> the <laughs> Howard University. Uh, my mom at the same time in the early 60s was um, in college at Brigham Young University. So I like to make Mormon jokes like, I don't care how you bring them, just bring them young. Um, uh, my, my, uh, just I'll go back one more generation and then I'll stop. On my mother's side, um, her family on, on both sides, both my maternal grandmother and my mater, um, maternal grandfather, um, are from Mormon pioneers oh, okay. um, who came from Europe and then crossed the American West um, pushing handcarts with all of the stories of imperialism and um, and violence that followed um, Mormon pioneers, but also all of their own stories of, of religious persecution, of identity-based persecution, and of, of not just working class status, but poverty. Mm -hmm. um, I like to say my white folks are so white that this is not, I'm not just making this as a joke, this is really true. My grandfather drove a Wonder Bread truck. Um, and, <laughs> That's really true. Um, and, and later became a, a Chrysler a sales manager. Uh, my grandmother finished high school but never college. Um, and those two working class folks, a woman who never worked outside the home for pay, and a man who drove a Wonder Bread truck and was a sales manager at a Chrysler place, put five kids through college, okay. basically debt free. Mm -hmm. um, owned a home, and when my grandfather and grandmother both passed, there was enough money that all of the grandkids uh, have a little something for our down payments. Mm -hmm. When I think about, sometimes people ask, well, how did we get where we are now? And I think part of it is that that story isn't possible in America anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it just simply, it isn't possible for anyone, not for hardworking white folks, not for hardworking black folks, not for hardworking Syrian refugees, not for hardworking Latinx immigrants. None of, nobody can live that story. And um, I think a lot of times we're looking for why. And yeah. so we, we look for blame. On my dad's side, again, you can't, you can't ask me who I am. I gotta do two generations. Um, my grandfather on my father's side owned restaurants in the Jim Crow South. Mm -hmm. um, and there are stories of Mac um, yelling at police mm -hmm. um, in the 1930s and 40s yeah. in Richmond. Um, he passed very young um, when my father was only 12 years old. Um, my grandmother was a domestic worker oh. uh, and a seamstress and a genius. People would bring to my grandmother a photograph, just a photograph of a wedding dress. Oh. And they'd say, Miss Rosa, this is what I would like my dress to look like. Okay. She'd stand up, take three measurements, and she could make you a wedding dress without a pattern. Oh, okay. Yeah. She raised five children in the Jim Crow South with nothing. Mm -hmm. um, my father and his twin brother, the youngest of those five children that she raised, went on to college, went on to graduate school, both became college professors. My father became the first dean of African American Affairs at the University of Virginia, yeah. and my uncle, the head of aeronautical engineering at MIT. Okay. So, so right. that's why I'm, all right. I'm I, there. <laughs> I, am, I am the child and grandchild of those well, the theme tonight is working together, sharing the dream. Beyond your profession, how do you think that you're sharing the dream? Well, 
um, even though it is no longer in vogue, um, I try to be awake and not asleep. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate the, um, as, as my colleague said, I appreciated hearing the students mm -hmm. deliver I Have a Dream with more context. Mm -hmm. um, typically, we get the Hallmark version of Dr. King. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's bad enough that we freeze him in 1963. Y'all know the man was not assassinated immediately after the, <laughs> after the March on Washington. Right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm laughing, but we freeze him in 1963. Not only did he continue, but he changed a lot. Yes in that half decade That's after right. that, before he was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And I think when we leave Dr. King in 63, first of all, when we call his speech at the March for Jobs and Justice, the I Have a Dream speech, we misunderstand every part of it. He wasn't even planning to talk about the dream, but interestingly Mahalia. enough, Dr. King was kind of losing the crowd. Maybe and Mahalia Jackson said, right? Mahalia said, tell, tell, him about tell, the dream, dream. tell him about the dream. Right? Tell him right? about the dream, right? Tell him about the dream. So like, Mahalia Jackson ain't gonna, ain't gonna lose a crowd. Yeah, fine. Right, right. She, 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 not, she can notice, she noticed the crowd was getting restless. She was like, mm, tell him about the dream. Tell him about the dream. Tell right. him about the dream. So, the dream. so I wanna, um, you know, I don't know that I share the dream um, in the sense of wanting to be actively, I, I'm hoping that I'm sharing the work, let me put it that way. I'm hoping that I'm sharing the work, not sharing the dream, because okay. I, I do wanna be awake in, as much as I can be in mm -hmm. these moments. Um, and, and I, you know, I'm a little irreverent. Um, I'm not much of a rule follower, although now that I'm 50, I tend to follow more rules, because mm -hmm. my body <laughs> imposes some of those rules. Um, and then I accidentally raised two children who aren't rule followers. And it turns out, if you raise children who you want to challenge authority, guess who is the first authority they challenge? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's why people yeah. make rules. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I struggle with Dr. King as a figure. I mean, I really struggle with him. On the one hand, am profoundly inspired and moved by and a student of his work and of his writing and of his speaking and of his contributions mm -hmm. and also a little annoyed at our obsession with Dr. King to the exclusion and our obsession with 1963 Dr. King to the exclusion both of other aspects of Dr. King as well as to the exclusion of, well, quite frankly, all the women and queer folk oh, yeah. who were around him who were doing the so much of the work. Yeah. How, um, how do you think that uh, Dr. King influenced your work? Say one more time. How, did, how, did, how do you think that Dr. King's work influenced your work and what you do, your profession? So I will tell you, since book banning is kind of a thing now, that um, one of the lessons of my father um, is that the number one way to make children read something is to ban it. Mm -hmm. um, yes. yes. Yes, right? Okay, like, it's, it's very funny to me to watch books being banned in the set. I don't mean funny, like, oh, ha, ha. But like as a college professor, I can tell you children don't read. Don't read no books. <laughs> no. You don't have to ban it, right? Stop it. But as soon as you ban it, so, so in my house, what my, my, my parents did was they put all of the most radical revolutionary books on the top shelf and told us we weren't allowed to read them, mm -hmm. right? They were like, they were basically like, you know, those, sh those books are like, you know, intellectual pornography, right? So they're up on the top shelf. You can't read them. I'm, I'm the youngest of five. I don't really know young people. Millennials, Z Gen. I'm, I'm the youngest of five, and I'm Gen X, so I have um, boomer siblings and such. And, and I can tell you, I have no idea where my parents were for most of my childhood. Um, presumably, they were at work or cooking or something. But um, the reason that that Charlie Brown joke works, where like all the adults are just like this disembodied voice, is because we didn't really hang around our parents the way y'all do. Like. I have no idea where my parents were. I, again, presumably at work, but mostly I hung out with my older siblings. Um, and the minute that the parents were gone, which was a lot of the time, we got up to that top shelf and started reading. Mm -hmm. And so one of the books on that top shelf was um, Where Do We Go From Here yeah. and Why We Can't Wait. Yeah. Um, so Dr. King influenced me from the, like, I'm a little kid reading like. <laughs> um, so that, that's part of it. Um, yeah. I also, I grew up in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, and although Sarah Palin cannot see Russia from her bedroom window, um, 
Uh, I couldn't actually see Monticello from my bedroom window, but in a similar kind of way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Thomas Jefferson was a huge figure. So I knew the Declaration, I mean, I still like know the Declaration of Independence to my toes. And so when I think about that speech that we just heard the young people, for me, um, that Dr. King calls the Declaration of Independence the promissory note. Mm -hmm. Promissory note. Right? It's the check that, that the American founding wrote that came back Insuff right, insufficient funds. And so I think for me that is, it's both my optimism and my crankiness, is I really am an optimist of the American project. It's pretty exciting to live in a country where that check was even written, because mm -hmm. most nations, <laughs> I'm sorry, in Great Britain, didn't nobody ever write down. All, you know, we, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all persons are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's just, this is so wildly not self-evident in mm -hmm. 1776. Um, so it's extraordinary and exciting to live in a country where that is the aspiration, and it's irritating to live in a country where that's the aspiration and these are the material realities. Yeah. Well, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that there are oftentimes in the, in the uh, audience uh, such e as events like this. And for the benefit of helping them map out their next steps in the educational pursuit of their life, tell us about your educational journey. What was your journey like? I dropped out of high school. As of, as of right now today, I do not have a high school diploma. I oh. never received one. Um, so every student in here who walked across the stage has already achieved more in their education. I tell you, again, yeah. I raised these little troublemaking children and my <laughs> daughter was very proud to graduate from high school. Um, so I dropped out of high school and directly into college. Um, but I'm not gonna tell, like I could tell this as a story about how smart I am and, and how bored I was in high school and certainly that was some of it. But here's the true truth. My boyfriend in high school was a year older than and he was leaving to go to college. And I was like, I'm not staying here. <laughs> now, to be fair, I had an extraordinary boyfriend in high school, and he did go on and, in fact, win a Super Bowl with the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> so I wasn't totally wrong in like trying to hitch my wagon to the star a little bit. Right, I mean, I'm, I wasn't totally out there, but as you might imagine, he became a D1 college athlete, so that relationship didn't exactly, I wouldn't call it lasting. Um, but, I, but I, you know, so I say this in part for young people, again, because I am a little irreverent. I'm not, I try to be respectful, but I'm not very respectable. And I do want you to know that you can make good choices for bad reasons, and sometimes even bad choices, and, and, and still it will turn out. Um, but there's a lot of different, it's not like, oh, it just will turn out. There's a lot of reasons that it turns out. But um, I think sometimes, especially highly accomplished young people, like the young people we saw tonight, will not take risks because you'll think that if you take a risk, um, you might get a B, <laughs> right? Or, or you might fail in some way. And so I'm just going to say, um, I do want you to, read books, especially the ones who've been banned, and to take some risks. So basically my, my journey is I dropped out of high school. Because I was dropping out of high school, there were only a few, this was in 1990, the beginning of time for the young people. Um, there were only a few colleges in the country that would accept a student who Had did not have a high school diploma. Right. I applied to and got into Harvard. I applied to and got into William & Mary and I applied to and got into Wake Forest University. Mm -hmm. um, Harvard seemed like, I, I mean, it would have been the same as if I had applied and gotten into like the University of Tibet. Like it just didn't, <laughs> I was like, I don't, it just seemed, I mean, I'd never been north of DC. I was like, this is, no, that's not happening. Um, William and Mary, a lot of my friends from high school are going. But I chose Wake Forest for one reason. At the time that I chose to go to Wake Forest, Dr. Maya Angelou was a college professor there. She'd come uh, four years prior in 1986, and I thought, huh, maybe I'll get to take a class with Dr. Angelou. Mm -hmm. Not only did I take one, 
But in the semester I was taking one with her, I was pledging Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Mm. I, well, <laughs> it, except I maybe was not sleeping a lot or eating right or doing it, you know, I'm not gonna really, things were happening and I maybe, um, I got bronchitis and then I took erythromycin which gave me a systemic allergic reaction, oh. and I had to drop all my classes. Oh. And so at 18 years old, I stood flat-footed in front of Dr. Maya Angelou and said, well, will you sign my drop card? Imagine dropping Maya Angelou's class. Oh, man. Mm. To pledge the other sorority, because she's an AK. Right? Yes. yes. So bear with me on this story. So she looks at me, and what she should have said was, get out of here. <laughs> Right? She should have signed it and sent me on my way and be like, you don't even, you don't even understand who I am. And instead, she said, Miss Harris, aren't you a scholarship student? Yes, ma'am. How are you going to complete school if you drop all these classes? Tears. I don't know. <laughs> Come this summer, work for me, um, and, and I'll pay your summer school tuition. Oh, great. That was the summer of 1992. That fall, Bill Clinton was elected president. That January, she delivered the inaugural poem. Oh. And guess who was the person who answered out her fan mail? Oh, man. So this giant yeah. gave me a front row seat to history, right? I read all of the fan mail coming to a black woman from Stamps, Arkansas, mm -hmm. who had delivered the inaugural poem at the presidential inauguration. Mm -hmm. I'm, again, 18, 19 years old. And she saw me all the way through college. Uh, she threw my wedding to my first husband. Marriage was a mistake, wedding was great. Um, <laughs> and um, and I, she even granted an interview to me um, when I was still on air. Uh, in 2014, I decided to go back to Wake Forest in large part because I needed more time with her. Mm -hmm. um, I accepted the job in April and she passed a month later. Oh man. Um, so my educational journey is reading the banned books, dropping out of high school, connecting with Maya Angelou, mm -hmm. having her treat me in ways that were just about grace, going on getting a PhD, running off to the University of Chicago, teaching there for seven years while this guy named Barack Obama was wandering around campus, getting to know a lot about him, mm -hmm. um, teaching at Princeton for um, five years, uh, doing work on Hurricane Katrina, where I met the right husband, uh, got married, went down to <laughs> Tulane, uh, and then came back to be near Dr. Angelo, um, who left me, but also left me a legacy. Oh, that's great. Thanks. You missed something that I think I want to share with people. You went to theological seminary. Oh, <laughs> I did that after the PhD. Oh, enough. after. So I was a junior faculty member at the University of Chicago, and I was writing about um, um, black people, uh, or sort of black churches. I was writing about black, black churches, church, black. right? So think about. Um, do they still do this little hand game? Here's the church, here's the steeple, look inside, here are the people. Yeah. Right, okay, so that's kind of how sociologists, political scientists talk about the church, like it's just a place. Like it could be McDonald's or the church or, right? But I didn't, I wasn't engaging it in terms of faith. I oh. was just, I was just engaging the institution. Okay. And I was like, I, I'm missing something. So I was leading with my head when I went to seminary but I was only there a pretty short time where the real question showed up. And it's a question I think that reflects on Dr. King. So I've told you a little bit about my Grandma Rosa. And when we traced back from Grandma Rosa, we found her grandmother who had sold on a street corner in Richmond, Virginia. So she um, you know, was raising her children not far from where her own grandmother had been sold into slavery. And I'm a trained empirical political scientist. Mm -hmm. I believe that something is true when you can 
gather empirical evidence, right? Yeah. Run a regression, and you can show me that it is true within you know two standard deviations. And I'm like, okay, I might think that's true. But I am descended from people who with absolutely no empirical evidence mm -hmm. in the context of intergenerational chattel bondage, knowing nothing but that from their parents and expecting nothing but that for their children, believed there was a God, believed that God saw them, believed that God loved them. Mm -hmm. So see, prosperity gospel is really easy. Right, prosperity gospel is, you know how you're gonna know God loves you? Cause you, you gonna pray for the car and you gonna get the car. You gonna pray for the fine man, you gonna get the fine man. You gonna pray for healing, you gonna get the healing. You gonna pray for the job, you gonna get the job. So you will be blessed and highly favored and everyone can see how blessed and highly favored you are cause when you put your hand up in church, the big ring will shine back <laughs> and the people will know that you're blessed and highly favored. But I'm from people who somehow believed they were blessed and highly favored in the context of intergenerational chattel bondage mm -hmm. with no empirical evidence. And that was not only an ideological or intellectual quandary for me, it was a spiritual crisis for me. So why does Dr. King, born in 1929, mm -hmm. born in 19, Dr. King would be we would probably be memorializing Dr. King even if he had not been assassinated. This is the 95th anniversary of his birth. Right. The likelihood that a black man born in Atlanta, Georgia in 1929 would still be alive is a very low possibility. Why did this black man born in 1929 in Atlanta, Georgia think that the American story had something to do with him? Mm -hmm. Why did the people I come from after intergenerational chattel bondage, why was it the first thing they did after they went and tried to find their people? The next thing they did was register to vote. Vote, right. Register to vote. The, the, yeah. <laughs> what are we made of? So I went to seminary because that was my question. Okay. My question was, when there is no evidence that God loves you, why do you think that God does? And what difference does that make to who we are politically and socially? And so it, I'm not attached, I just wanna be clear to, like that has to be a particular God for every person. I, I think there's an encounter with the narrative of uh, a poor boy born to an unwed teenage mom who's murdered by the state and resurrected there's you know like I get why my people were like oh yeah I know that too Jesus I got friends just like him yeah right so I understand why that's a definitive encounter with the divine but I think what I'm asking for more broadly is how do we be hum how are we humble enough and yet expansive and bold enough to believe something that we actually don't have evidence for mm -hmm. well I tell you have you ever taught a uh, Bible class on a Wednesday night? Or <laughs> are you, uh, uh, have you ever preached a sermon? I preach a lot of sermons. Oh, uh, yeah. Mostly in the Unitarian Universalist Church. So often my, um, uh, <laughs> the, day, um, the day after the inauguration of President Trump, uh, I preached at the All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church in Washington, D.C. It was a hard day for the Unitarians. Um, they, it was a hard day. A particularly hard day, white liberals were really beside themselves um, after the election of President Trump. Um, I mean, I think black folks weren't happy, but we've been black around mm -hmm. here before, mm -hmm. so we were like, well, it's Tuesday again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I do think that there, there was a population of people for whom the, the election of President Trump was really like definitively upsetting. Um, and I was, I was in a position to speak with some of those people, but I, I, um, I spoke from a, uh, the text of Edwina the Dinosaur. Oh. <laughs> um, I sometimes speak from the text of Charlotte's Web. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like we have a lot of, um, a lot of texts where we can, uh, we can gather um, strength and knowledge and, and stories. Um, but I, I teach a class, I'm teaching this semester on, um, identity, faith, and politics um, in the US. And I teach, I teach Latter-day Saints, um, and, and I teach black faith traditions. Okay. 
Again, uh, being an educator, I'm always concerned about the young people who are in the audience. And um, I recognize in the audience that there are possibly people here, here tonight, I dare say, to getting extra credit. <laughs> oh, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, if you came out in the cold on a, what is it, Wednesday night, and you're not getting extra credit, <laughs> You should ask for extra credits. <laughs> <laughs> but what would you like for these students to have in their notes? What would you like for them to include from this session? What, what, what would you want them to take away? I don't think it's a fair question. You don't? I don't. Um, <laughs> because um, I don't know if I'll resonate or not. I don't know what they'll, I mean, they mostly might just remember I heard some black lady who was in menopause talk about some stuff. Right? <laughs> like, like you just, like you just, it's it's really hard to know what people will take. Um, what I'll say is this: when I'm when I'm teaching, when I have not just a you know an hour with you, but when I have fifteen you know weeks, um, it is always my goal both to assign more reading than can be done and to say things um, that students actually. You know, some, some things that they'll understand, but a bunch of other things they won't. So for me, the moment as a teacher, the thing that I love the most um, is when like five years later I get the phone call from a student who's like, I just got it, right? We're like, you know, um, mm -hmm. I, I think of teaching um, not only as planting seeds, right? Obviously we're doing a lot of seed planting, but also it's like creating cognitive hooks. Right? So if someone, you know, I think of all the, the things I encountered that I didn't have any cognitive hooks to put them on, mm -hmm. and then sort of five, six, seven, ten years later, I was like, oh, during the entire, <laughs> you know, during the Obama administration, I had an opportunity to be inside the White House more than, you know, before that I'd just been an observer. And I was like, oh, I suddenly understand West Wing season three and four, right? Like I just hadn't previewed, like I didn't have anything. Yeah. So that's my goal is, you know, if I say something, um, you know, about the Declaration of Independence, about the relationship between King and the founding, about um, uh, the question of, you know, what it means to both have faith and empirical evidence, mm -hmm. right? Working together as opposed to opposed to each other. Yes. If any of those things stick, that's great. But if the only thing that sticks is some old lady talking about Maya Angelou, I'll, I'll take that too. Oh, okay, great. If somebody goes and looks at Maya Angelou, someone's like, who? And Googles it, that's, yes. yeah, I'm good yeah, with okay. that. Well, watching you on MSNBC, I was always pleasantly surprised by the young people and the diverse people who were at your table. And really pleased that there were not people from the old guard coming to your we had some old guard. We had, we had some old guard. <laughs> well, I'm talking, you know. We had Wade, we had Wade Henderson. Yeah, okay. Please join us. Yeah. <laughs> but when I always think about that, I always think and I would look and I would say, man, the vetting process that you went through, how in the world did MSNBC pick you knowing that you were not going to be a puppet and a little brown bobblehead? You weren't going to be they, any they of that. Did, they had no idea. They had no idea. Are you serious? The way they go into your background and all of that, they, they should have known that you were not going to come there. Oh, I enjoy what people think media is. <laughs> <laughs> you said the way they vet you, ma'am. <laughs> okay, so for folks who, who don't know sort of the outlines of the story, um, I, in 2012, started hosting um, a show, which I used to joke, oh, it'd be hard to fire me from this since it's called Melissa Harris Perry. <laughs> it wasn't so hard to fire me, it turns out. Uh, and I hosted from 2012 to 2016. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, MSNBC at the time was, um, you know, so this is a, kind of a, the start of the election year mm -hmm. that was the um, second term of the mm -hmm. Obama presidency. Mm -hmm. But in those first four years, from 2008 to 2012, okay. cable news was trying to respond to the Obama presidency by diversifying its yeah. um, sort of group of people who were listening and talking it. So this is the extent to which you have to understand what it means, I mean, why it's cracking me up. So I had worked at the University of Chicago. Yeah. Um, I had been 
on like local TV talking about then State Senator Obama who was running for the U.S. Senate. So, and at this point I had moved to Princeton, which is within an hour of the New York media market. Mm -hmm. So when he ran for president in 2008, I was simply a Princeton professor who lived close enough to get into the studio who actually knew something about this guy, Barack Obama. That was it. That's the extent of the vetting process, oh. right? There's no, there's no, there's a, almost no one works in any of these places and you're putting things together within sometimes six, seven, eight hours. That's how you end up with really bad people on TV, like horrible mm -hmm. humans. Um, and then you sort of the relationship builds over time and then they don't think about anything about who you were before. They're just like, oh, you're ours. So the, the job in 2012 is because MSNBC used to, on the weekends, exclusively have a show called Lock Up. Mm -hmm. So they would have news until about 10 in the morning, and then it was reality TV of people in jail yeah. for the rest of the day. Right. And somebody was like, you know, this is maybe not consistent with this, like, we wouldn't have used the word woke at the time, but like, wokey audience we're trying to get. Mm -hmm. So they were like, huh. We'll just put on a couple more shows. So they were just like kind of looking around as they put Chris Hayes on from 8 to 10, and then they put me on from 10 to noon. Right. And mostly because I was a college professor. I taught Monday through Thursday. I'd get on the plane. I'd fly to New York Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and fly back. And I was like, that's great. Because they were like, nobody else wants to work on the <laughs> damn weekends, but you will. Great, lady. Here's some dollars. Come work on the weekends. And no one watched. I mean, I don't mean the audience didn't watch. No one who worked there, the, the president, never watched that show for years. Never. For years. <laughs> Phil only watched that show when things would blow up. So when I, he never watched me on MSNBC. I would say he only watched me on Fox News. So only, like, only if, if something happened on the show mm -hmm. that drew the ire of the right, right? Then he would watch it, and then I'd get called to the principal's office. He didn't know what I was doing. The first Three months we were there, we did like a retrospective on Biggie Smalls. I assure you, no, no one, one had any idea what I was doing on this TV show. And, and I definitely knew that no one knew. And so we were like, I had all these young people of color and queer folks that were like, no straight white men at all who work there. Um, it, it, well, except Eric would be like, excuse me, I did. And, and I would have to say, Eric, you're Jewish. So like, no, like just no waspy, straight, white, cisgender men worked on this show ever at any point. So we were just wild. And so we would just call all of our, I mean, the reason is like, yeah, we just call all of our friends. And we're like, Jelani Cobb, you want to be on TV? We, Come on. And now Jelani Cobb is like, you know, the head of um, Columbia School of Journalism. Mm -hmm. You know, we would call, you know, and then Phil Griffin left. And there was a new boss, and he watched. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, in 2016, he started watching, and I was refusing to do something that we were told to do. Uh, we were told to take the empty podium. Oh. So um, when uh, Donald Trump was running for the presidency mm -hmm. in 2016, it was a common thing you'd see on all the cable news networks, um, an empty podium, and then there'd be a ticker that would go along the bottom and would say, Donald Trump to speak soon. And we were told, don't take, don't take um, Marco Rubio speaking, don't take Jeb Bush speaking, oh. don't take any of the actual candidates, take the empty podium. Anybody mm. know why? Donald Trump is wonderful for ratings. Oh. Anyone who tells you that Donald Trump prior to the presidency, during the presidency, or, or now, is at war with cable is lying to you. Donald Trump saved cable news. Mm -hmm. Ratings were plummeting. And Donald, <laughs> after President Trump was elected, there were record ratings for, I want to come to Dr. King on this for a second. Stick with me for just a second. So after President Trump was elected, there were record ratings for things like um, the confirmation hearings of his education secretary, Betsy DeVos. Like, mm -hmm. like it became top-rated television mm. to watch a Senate confirmation hearing right. of a department. Who's the secretary of education right now? <laughs> Y'all know. I mean, some of y'all know, but like, then, but, but I, but I, 
I bet you ain't, you did not, to, I bet it wasn't even carried. So he would come on, he would say outrageous things, and they were all, um, I, I can't tell whether they knew he was going to win or really thought he wasn't going to win, but it was very clear to me that if you did that, to any candidate, television is like, um, it's like love or like sunshine. It makes things grow. So if you put a television camera on anything, it will make it grow. And we were told to put a camera, a non-critical camera on this, and so it grew. I'm gonna wrap this to Dr. King because one of the things we misremember about Dr. King, um, you'll hear people say, we need a non-violent movement like Dr. King's. Mm -hmm. Dr. King's movement was not non-violent. Right. Violent. Um, you saw those images. There was vicious brutality. Mm -hmm. We did not get the 1964 Civil Rights Act because Dr. King said pretty words. Right. We did not get the 1965 Voting Rights Act because Dr. King said pretty words. We got the 1965 Voting Rights Act because people watched the brutal, bloody, mm -hmm. vicious harm right. of the state over and against John Lewis and others. We call it mm -hmm. Bloody Sunday. It's not just like Bloody Sunday. It's like, no, the actual blood of these actual right. people. Mm -hmm. Those pictures of the dogs and the fire hoses, those are children. That's the Birmingham Children's March. That's right. You know why you don't see pictures of Albany, Georgia? Because the head of the police in Albany, Georgia wasn't Bull Connor. Mm -hmm. And when the people marched, he just let them march. And then they went home and they ain't changed nothing. Mm -hmm. Dr. King's movement was strategic nonviolence for one purpose, to provoke violence mm -hmm. in order to make policy change. That's right. And that happened. Right. That happened. So, so Dr. King understood this, rel the, the year that Dr. King was born is also the year that there's a first public demonstration of a color TV set, mm -hmm. right? He understands the power of television. He understands the capacity of strategically, so you know, you hear, oh, nonviolent. No, no. No, no, the whole strategy was violence. It was just, it was actually strategic discipline right. Right. so that the violence would be provoked against, okay. right, against the movement. That's right. So, no, don't go out of here as students. I am going to say one thing. Don't go out of here and say that Melissa Harris Perry said Dr. King and Donald Trump are the same. That's, <laughs> not, that's not what happened. But what I will say is you have to understand, if you're gonna make strategic political moves and changes, you have to understand the incentive structure. So television, cable television, cable television news, the incentive structure is entertainment, mm -hmm. not information. Mm -hmm. NBC is owned by Universal. The best part of working there was a Universal Studio passes mm -hmm. in the summer. That is not the same thing, by the way, as your local NBC affiliate. I'm talking about NBC Universal cable news. Mm -hmm. ABC is owned by Disney, literally. Your news is coming to you from Mickey oh. Mouse and Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, these are entertainment industry and our brutality towards each other, our cruelty towards each other, having flat characters bringing, just repeating the same line over mm -hmm. and over again, that is good for entertainment and it is bad for democracy. Yes. But right now there's very little incentive for a thing that is good for democracy. So what Donald Trump is, is a salvation for cable news because he provides a villain, a good, strong, heavy villain or a hero. Yeah. Without any of the complexity of what democracy really is, which is most folks are sort of a mix yeah. of villain and hero. Well, we want to kind of switch it a bit, okay? Well, you know, you're an academic, and you have a PhD, and you've worked at Duke and all that, but you know, we've got some presidents, college presidents, that are being pushed out. What do you think about that? kind of thing that's happening and we're seeing that played out in the news. 
I knew Claudine, I know Claudine Gay very well. Um, she and I finished our PhDs in the same year. Okay. We were on the job market at the same time. We have one of those like professional frenemy relationships where you're mm -hmm. always kind of half looking out the side like, huh, what job did she, ooh, did she get tenure first? Or did I get tenure? Like, like I totally love her, but also slightly in competition with her. Okay. So when I got the TV show, I was like, I be Claudine Gay. <laughs> and then she became president of Harvard and I was like, Claudine Gay be me. Right, right okay. Okay. So it's very hard. Yeah. It, uh, it's very hard to watch. Yeah. Well, but but let me just say this: uh, Claudine Gay will be what she's experiencing undoubtedly right now is um, emotionally, personally difficult, challenging. But materially, Claudine Gay will be fine. Okay. Right, because she okay. she's remaining at Harvard as a tenured like this is a really good job if you can get it. Right. Mm -hmm. So materially, she will be okay. Okay. Even though symbolically. It's an act of like, um, uh, it's a, it's a, it's painful. I think for academics, but particularly for Black women academics, mm -hmm. I don't want us to, to miss another story. What that's the, so this is the story of a Black woman who took her own life at Lincoln University. Oh yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I want to say I am unhappy with what's happened with Claudine <coughs> Gay. I, I think that they failed. I think all three of those. Presidents failed, failed in their answer, mm -hmm. um, but I also think that, that that a single answer is not the measure of an entire uh, presidency mm -hmm. or an entire career. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to be measured by my lowest moments in public, um, and probably shouldn't be measured by my highest. Um, and I certainly think she had a right to continue, but but I am more concerned. I want to be really clear. I am more concerned with the forces in the academy. Not that are pushing Claudine Gay out as, as important as that is. I am more concerned with the forces of the academy that allowed the bullying and brutality of an African American faculty member and administrator at the highest level at Lincoln University, yeah. such that she took her own life. Yeah. Because she is not going to be okay materially. Mm -hmm. Her community is not okay. And all of us, I think, who knew her, knew her work, feel, um, feel brutalized by that. What, what advice do you have for um, the nice president here at Saginaw Valley, Dr. Green? Yes. Oh, none, except, I mean, God bless you, because, <laughs> um, or as we say in the South, bless your heart, which sort of means bless your heart and sort of doesn't. Um, uh, I, I wake up every morning glad that I am not a college professor. Let me, let, let me say, just let me tie it back to Dr. King. The easiest thing we can do is to tell the hallmark story of Dr. King. Um, to say that he is, you know, right now he is universally well regarded, mm -hmm. right? So um, public opinion polls show that more than 90% of white Americans and basically 100% of African Americans um, ha hold Dr. King in high regard. Neither, uh, that was not true in 1968 no. um, before his assassination. Um, uh, fewer than 50% um, of white Americans held him in high regard. And something like 50% of African Americans held him in high regard, but saw him as irrelevant mm -hmm. in 1968. So uh, it is a reminder that, um, uh, again, Dr. King wasn't a speaker. <laughs> like he said this, he said that. He wasn't a speaker. He was a preacher. He was a movement organizer. Yeah. He spent a lot of time giving speeches because that's how he made money for the movement. movement. He was a strategist. Mm -hmm. He was sometimes a friend and sometimes not of other strategists. Um, and he was not well liked. No. And despite the fact that young people sometimes remember that like, oh, Malcolm X was the revolutionary and Dr. King was the accommodationist. Um, Malcolm X was assassinated in an internecine intraracial battle. Mm -hmm. Dr. King was assassinated by the forces of white supremacy. Right. And they don't assassinate accommodationists. Yeah. It's not what happens. Mm -hmm. So we have, to, we have to try to remember, often, and I'll, I promise I'll finish on this, sometimes people will say to me, how do you get young people to be social activists? And I say, I never try to get a young person to be a social activist. To do that would be for me to make you think that social activism is rewarding, wealth generating, beneficial to your family, 
good for your health. Uh, I want to be really clear, change making is none of those things. Okay. Um, believing in something to the point that you lose your job, mm -hmm. that you take abuse, that you are violated violently, mm -hmm. that you are hated and despised and maybe even assassinated, that you are taken from your family. <laughs> I don't encourage young people to do that. Yes. It is only when young people tell me, I can't do anything else. I'm so compelled to it that I, I can't not do it. Then I'm always willing to try to be a conduit to assist young people in doing it. But I encourage us not, it is not a good self-care space. Okay. And so I think if there's any advice, it would just be on the days when nobody likes you, remember they ain't like Dr. King either. Okay. <laughs> but, We'd like to thank you so much, Melissa, for all of the things you have shared with us. And now we are going to make sure that we move to the next part of our program because I'm getting the thank you. work. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Water. Thank you once again to Kermit Diggs and Dr. Harris Perry for such a wonderful, insightful fireside chat that will be remembered for years to come. Our musical selection is presented by Victorious Believers Ministry. I'm so excited. The Praise Ensemble, Reverend Chris Pryor is the pastor, the Reverend Pryor. When the musical selection concludes, we will be hearing closing remarks from Dr. Thorns. So please welcome Victorious Believers to the stage. Good evening. As we continue to celebrate, we come to bless God for all the great things that he's done. Come on, if you will, just put your hands together.
Thank you. Let's give him another round of applause. Well, I'm just going to pretend like I am. My sister was cool. She did an amazing job. Let's give I don't know where she is, and uh, Kermit, let's give her a nice round of applause. That's not easy. We come to the uh, part of our program where we just want to acknowledge uh, all of the people who have made this to, to be a success. My husband just told me, keep it short, don't mess it up. It's been a great program, don't get up there. So I'm gonna keep it real short. But we have to take time to recognize and thank. And I'm gonna start with you in the audience. Give yourselves a nice round of applause. Thank you. And this amazing committee, if you're here, please stand. Please stand. Hear your names up here. You're in here somewhere. Please stand. Yes. Because we can't do it. We can't do it without this uh, committee. And we just about need all year. Um, or we, we even call some extra meetings so to make sure, right, Heather? And also, my next slide, um, I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, and if you're in the uh, audience here, you can stand or raise your hand. I just want, to know, want you to know how much we appreciate um, SVSU, Dr. Grant is expensive. Even the water out here costs us, okay? But we just thank all of these amazing sponsors, and they have been with us for years, and I know they'll be with us again next year. So if you're one of our outstanding sponsors, please stand. Please stand, we just want to say thank you. Come on, Heather, yes, Dow. Huntington Bank, thank you. Consumers Energy, yes, thank you. All of these, Spence Brothers, and as you can see, and they're on the back of your program. And you know, every year, um, I kind of run a little short, so I have to go to Brother Thorns and ask him if he would be a friend. And he, he said yes, so I thank him. And the McQueens are in the audience, thank you so much for being friends of them, okay? And Judge Atkins, all the way from Detroit. I don't even have to ask her now. She just sends the check. Thank you so much. Stan, please. Yes, thank you. 
And then when the uh, Deltas found out that Melissa was coming, boy, my phone was buzzing. Deltas, please stand. Thank you so much for being here and for your support. Yes, thank you. So our next, uh, and oh yes, Dr. Grant, I know this is your second MLK program. Last year was the first, but I just want to personally thank you for your leadership and for allowing me and the rest of this committee to do what we did tonight. Tonight was amazing, and we thank you for your leadership. So here's the date for next year, because I have some people who say, well, what is the date? I don't remember, whatever, I had something planned. January the 15th, 2025. Once again, thank you so much for coming. And let us continue to find ways, I think I have another slide, to find ways to keep Dr. King's dream alive. And one being tomorrow, Saginaw Community Foundation, Saginaw Valley State University, Delta College, and other organization, uh, Hemlock, some of the others, we will be launching a new initiative in our community. And we would invite you at 10 a.m. to come to this press conference where we will share with you our strategic plan but see, DEI is important to Saginaw, just like it's important to Midland, and they have their strategic plan and a program, and Bay City, now Saginaw Valley, I mean Saginaw Community Foundation, <laughs> we will reveal ours on tomorrow. At the end of the program, there will be people at the doors who will pass out to you a press release if you're interested in coming. And with that note, Thank you so much, and we're going to try this again this year. Last year didn't work. Okay, ready?